uh, today for this free opportunity to learn a few things about taking your TRIO pre-college summer programs online. Now, I know that is the title of um, this particular presentation. We recognize, however, that several people have signed up that are also um, professionals of, of college level programs, uh, as well as some of the community-based TRIO programs like EOC as well. And we want to make sure that you are aware that there will be something for you to gain here as well. So don't feel like you're out of place, even though our focus will be specifically to some of the pre-college programs. Almost everything that we share today will be for general use and is a general best practice. We want to welcome you all again on behalf of myself, Antonio Robinson, uh, one of the co-founders of the Minority Education Initiative. Um, Dr. Alicia Hill, uh, who is such a, who's been such a great find. Um, she's an amazing person. She's very well accomplished, as you can see right here. Uh, she's with My Learning Partners and various other endeavors, um, and we are so happy to have her. Um, she is a content expert. She does a little bit of everything, guys, and you will see just how talented she is um, uh, later on in our presentation. And of course, uh, who does not know or can't forget about Troy Curry, uh, Mr. Creative, uh, Mr. Innovative. Um, he is the CEO and founder of STEM Wars, as well as co-founder of MEI, former president of Georgia Trio. Um, and he is here with us today as well. So thank you guys for considering our uh, this opportunity and thank you for being here. And we're not gonna take too long. Um, we're, um, we're gonna jump right in momentarily. Now, I want you guys to listen, to make sure that you use the chat feature, okay? We're gonna use our chat feature a lot today, all right? So in the chat feature, you guys will use the chat to ask questions. Uh, you use the chat to make comments. You use the chat to give us a thumbs up. Uh, round of applause, whatever you would like to do in the chat, please use the chat feature. Also, be aware that, guys, this is just a sample of some of the things that you can do. We are trying to be cognizant of the time, the time that you have. We're also trying to be cognizant of attention span. And so with that in mind, we want to make sure that you are aware that we're, we would love to connect with you all. We would love to hear from you all, but we also want you to know that we're going to be moving pretty swiftly. So if you do have questions, which we know you will, please put them in the chat box and we, were, we are going to certainly answer them um, and try to get those answered either toward the end of the presentation um, or we're going to answer, we can answer them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, there's also going to be at the end, uh, which you may get in the email and you may have already, there is going to be a survey um, that we're asking you to uh, please, please, please uh, fill out, take a look at. You can uh, ask any of your questions there as well, okay? Uh, let us know how we did. Um, we are going to be, uh, we want to continue to do this in the future. And so um, our goal is to ensure um, that you are getting uh, what it is that you need. So without further ado, we're gonna move right into the presentation. All right, so understanding this, as we move online, ladies and gentlemen, we have to understand that it is very, very important that you assess the technology capabilities of your audience. We have to understand that everybody wants to, you know, as soon as this pandemic happened, people wanted to jump right over into, um, right over into online programming, right? And sometimes when we make those decisions, sometimes we can make those hastily and not realize that our demographic does not always have access to the proper technology just for you to move your entire program online, okay? So, what you could, what we want you to think about is these particular facts, all right? So households are learning, earning less than 30,000 a year, which I have quite a few in my program. 20%, 6% of those families are smartphone dependent, meaning they do everything on their cell phone. There's no house phone. There are not a lot of computers. They may surf the internet and all these things on the cell phone. Um, they, 46% like a traditional computer, PC, uh, and 44% don't even have access to broadband service. So they may be relying on their cell phones for that. And this was in a study by Pew, and understand this, while students are social media savvy, most are not technologically astute, meaning they could show you how to get on Instagram and Snapchat and all these other things, but realize this, 
they are not technologically astute. So assuming that just because they can navigate a few social media platforms uh, will not bode well when it comes to switching to online learning, okay? So be aware of that as you choose your various learning platforms. So we'll move on. And I'm seeing people in the chat from all over. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you for sharing where you're from. Please put that in the chat box. And um, we appreciate that. So program stakeholder assessment. You need to assess what's going on with your students. Here is a sample assessment. This will also work. And when I say stakeholder, this, this means family as well as uh, maybe even your teachers could be a staff. You can adjust this for anybody. But we're going to pull this up and share it with you guys so you can see exactly what we're talking about as a sample assessment. And I want you to think about as you're assessing your students, um, these are some of the things. First of all, you're gonna ask, of course, do they plan to attend the program? One of the things that I will say this, and we put this together as a quick sample, if they say no, you may wanna ask them why. Okay, and you, be, you might be surprised what their answers might be. Um, of course, their name, their school, and here's some of the questions. Which of the following do you have access to? A home computer or a laptop that's less than three years old <clears throat> and operational. What, now, why am I asking whether it's less than three years old? Well, the thing about it is we know that, you know, most of our students, if they get a laptop, a lot of times they get that Walmart special, you know, during Christmas time. You know, they get that, that $200 laptop and by the 1st of January, laptop full of all kind of viruses and stuff and hadn't worked the rest of the year. So you need to ask what type of electronic device they have. Do they have a school issue device, cell phone with internet? Just finding out what their technological capabilities are in terms of access to technology, okay? And then do you have access to a safe, quiet learning space? How in the world are we gonna have online programming and we don't, accept, we don't at, uh, assess uh, what the learning environment is at home because they don't have these learning environments that are set up at school. They could be responsible for kids. Um, has anybody in the household lost employment due to COVID? Why do we ask that? Because we want to assess the house um, situation because guess what? Guess who may have to work because mom lost a job. Don't know if you guys have been paying attention, but uh, next time you go to Lowe's, Home Depot, Walmart, and some of the big box stores, look at how the age of the hirees are changing. Why? These kids, the kids have shown to be resistant to COVID. And so it's smart for these folks to hire some of these young people. Okay, so think about that. Uh, do you plan to work this summer? Assessing things like that help you understand what the availability of the student is and how you need to plan. Okay. The reason why you need to know these things, because as you're structuring your program, you're doing it in consideration of everybody that's involved. So for instance, in my program at the very beginning, we had about 80% of individuals that said they were gonna participate at the, uh, when I asked back in February. COVID hit, that dropped to 65%. Why? Many had to work. You had people who had screen fatigue. You had all types of factors, mitigating factors that impacted a person's intent to attend. So actually assessing whether they're going to attend or not, and their capability of being in your program is very, very important. And use it, we, this is a simple Google, Google Doc that we use, and of course it can be adjusted. Asking your teachers, did you, do you, are you sure whether your instructors have a laptop? Do, are you providing that laptop? Will you provide that laptop? All of those different things. Now, these federal guidelines, this, this is for upward bound projects, okay? This is for regular upward bound projects in general, okay? So a lot of people think that there are some type of, that you are required to have upward bound five, six hours a day. Uh, in the summertime for your six-week summer program. Folks, I want you to read this. It must be six weeks in length unless the grantee can demonstrate to the secretary that it could be shorter. It also says that the project should be at least five days a week. And it says provide participants with one or more of the services that we are to provide at least five days a week. Now, somebody tell me, is there anywhere in here that says the kids got to be in class five, six hours a day? Does it say that you have to entertain, you have to take up their time all day long? It does not. It says one or more services five days a week. Why is this important? Because as you structure your summer program, you have to do it in consideration of the fact that these kids have been through a lot, in consideration of their uh, screen time. A lot of, a lot of uh, folks have gone to online, um, online learning, but many of them have gone to independent asynchronous learning where 
they are they're having to study on their own and they're having to spend a lot of time researching and things of that nature and so when it came to upward bound for the summer a lot of them was like man uh -uh, i got to unplug i got to i got to get away well why why do you have to get away well because i'm tired of being online all the time so here comes up we're bound saying hey we're gonna be on here from nine in the morning to two o'clock in the afternoon and the kid is gonna be like nah i ain't with it see you in the fall so be mindful of that and so we um in, in a little bit later mr curry is going to talk to you a little bit about scheduling and things of that nature that will be friendly to the mindset of the students during this time. So things to keep in mind, okay? The reason we went through that is because you're trying to ascertain the mindset, the mindset of the student, So and, and how you shape your mindset around that while operating during the pandemic, okay? Then the stakeholder assessment uh, is going to make sure that you're checking everyone, staff, family, um, the students themselves. You, you must make sure that you assess all of these things, and then, you still, your expectations can still be ambitious, but make it attainable, okay? Make it still ambitious and attainable. And then you wanna offer re re remediation and enrichment. Think about this. I know in some states, the kids went home in March and weren't engaged. If they didn't have uh, a computer, if they didn't have a ride to pick up the packets every week, they just been sitting at the crib. So what should you be offering this summer? What should you be offering? You might want to offer some remediation as to what the kids were taking pre-pandemic and then start to use that to shape your program offerings for the summer, preparing them, preparing them for what's coming in the fall. Because guess what? If you've got a kid that wants to be an engineering student and they started calculus and in March that calculus class ended or pre-cal and they're going into calculus in the fall, they don't have the foundation that they need to go and be successful in the fall. So you should be preparing them for that. And so a sample student assessment and those things um, are very necessary. And make sure that you're using standards to assess these things, okay? Um, so that's why we want to start with, you can't even, even, you shouldn't even begin to shape your program until you assess the state of your audience, the state of the people who are going to be servicing folks. And you may even have to assess the state of your college to find out whether you could provide laptops and things of that nature, should the kids not be able to. So those are the things you need to be thinking about first. All right, these are some uh, other assistance tools that you need to think about. So if you need more assistance um, with resources and things of that nature, we provide that type of stuff. Staff assessment, student assessment, the home technology assessment. Um, we have a complete service package uh, that will, that is available, and you can complete the form at the end um, to tell us what you your needs may be. All right. So everybody, welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, I just want to start by saying this move to online platforms it can be a game changer for your programs um, and the services that you offer. Um, it's going to have it offers flexibility, um, self paced instruction. But we realize, as Antonio was saying, that our low income first generation students that we serve they're gonna be affected the most by this transition and they're gonna have the greatest learning curve due to other socioeconomic um, uh, factors that they encounter. And so that's why assessment, assessment is so, so important. Um, you wanna make sure that you know your demographic and you know the services they need. Um, finding a balance between structure and flexibility is gonna be your greatest advocate when implementing a successful virtual program. And nothing is more important than keeping your um, at-risk students um, stable and engaged during this time. Um, as Antonio was saying, also, as many students, they've been pulled away um, from relationships that ground them and the school and did, um, did during this pandemic, we are operating in a pandemic. And so we want to be mindful of that. And uncertainty brings crisis if it's stress during this time. And so we want to make sure we show up for our students now more than ever and understanding the difference between synchronous and asynchronous. The first thing you need to decide is if you're going to host a traditional class, which means all the students receive learning and instruction at the same time, or if you're gonna adopt a more flexible schedule in which the courses are made available and students are given a time frame to complete the assignments. Um, again, synchronous and asynchronous. Synchronous just means that the learning is online or distance education, and it happens simultaneously in real time where all the students get the same information at the same time. Um, whereas asynchronous means that it's through online channels, pre-recorded information, and the students don't get any real-time interaction. Many programs are moving towards a hybrid model, which is where it includes a blend of both asynchronous and synchronous models, 
or synchronous learning methods. Um, but regardless of the learning style that you guys select, we want to make sure that the programs that, um, that have, we want you to know that the programs that have experienced the greatest success in transitioning to virtual formats, they have a clear syllabus um, for their academic instructions and all parties are on the same page about understanding the expectations of the program. If you click down, we're going to go, I'm going to go over the synchronous um, schedule. So you know your program better than anyone else, and you know the culture that your program operates under, um, the interest and participation levels of your students as well, and so the capabilities of your staff and instructors need to be taken into consideration, and you want to be mindful of these factors when you're creating your schedule. Um, well, as Antonio said, upper bound programs are required to offer six weeks of instruction, but you do have the flexibility to revamp your system and implement a supplement program that works best um, for you and will be the most successful. Um, due to screen fatigue, though, and other factors, it will not be feasible or realistic to think that we're going to be able to engage our students for full days that we've traditionally done with our in-person programming efforts. So again, you want to shorten your day. You want to understand what your students need and basically have a clear um, understanding of the information you're trying to present, but make sure that it's ambitious but attainable. So while we want to keep them engaged, we don't want to overwhelm them or overwhelm ourselves trying to do too much in this short amount of time. Um, we've consulted programs, and just being honest, we've consulted programs who had eight to nine hour virtual days planned for their students. It's not realistic and it doesn't work. You're going to lose them, and unfortunately, you might not be able to get them back once things get back to normal. And so programs are faced with two competing factors, and you don't want to overwhelm your students, but you want to ensure you keep them engaged. And so it's finding that good balance between the two to make sure that the schedule actually works. Um, we realize how much learning has been lost, though, but we want to make sure that we're being realistic. Um, if you look at the schedule below, the start times can vary, but it's important to consider your students and what's going to garner the best results. This is an A-B schedule or block schedule in which three subjects are offered on Monday and Wednesday and another three subjects are offered on Tuesday and Thursday. So again, students aren't overwhelmed. And then on this total, six subjects that they'll get this summer. And then Fridays can be reserved for special guests and virtual tours. If you also notice, they only have three hours of instruction. Um, or three blocks of instruction each day, saving the fourth block for you and your team if you want to offer office hours from your teachers or if you want to have virtual meetings with your students and one-on-one -on -one sessions. So again, being mindful, it's very similar to the academic schedule we would have for our um, residential or even day camp programs, commuter programs during the summer. We just condensed it though, and we suggest and condense it to whereas you're only focusing on the academic portions. If you want to, you can actually add other pieces but again, being very, very mindful of the student's time and the screen time that they're encountering. Um, the next slide will show you our asynchronous options, which might be more conducive, as Antonio was saying. Once you do your assessment, you'll be able to determine what works best for your students. And again, many are um, implementing a hybrid version of these two programs to where they offer classes during a specific time, but they allow for students to log in and play back the videos at a later time where that might be more conducive for them. And asynchronous, we found, works better for students who have limited access to technology or devices. So if you're in a household where you have multiple people sharing a cell phone or multiple people sharing a laptop, um, they might have classes or work they have to do this summer as well. And so we encourage you to offer an asynchronous schedule where students can basically log in at their leisure and get the work done. We encourage you to give them a time frame, say, hey, you have 24 hours to get this work done. And so students can, if they were hourly riser, they can wake up and do it. Or if they have access to internet later on in the day, then that's when it might be more beneficial for them to do it. But even with asynchronous, we still encourage you to give them time frames. So if they open it up, tell them that this should take you approximately this amount of time because we want to be mindful of screen fatigue and we don't want students to spend all day or not enough time working on it if they're doing it on their own. Um, now we want to talk about screen time, which is really, really important. Um, that's why we kept this virtual workshop really brief. We find that students' attention time and individuals' attention time during this pandemic um, has shortened, honestly. And so they're watching more things online, but they're watching at a quicker pace. And so even if you notice the success of things like TikTok and other things of that nature, it's because these videos are short and to the point. And so students' attention spans is very short. They're not looking to watch a full-on hour-long presentation, and they might not have the um, resources to actually do it. And so if you look at the schedule that we've um, outlined below, you want to be mindful that while you're only asking the student to log in and be present with the asynchronous with the synchronous schedule, you're only asking them to be present in class. 
for three to four hours a day or two to three hours a day, but then you still have to be cognizant of the other screen time that you're requiring of them. So, hey, I want you to be online for two to three hours in class, but then I'm giving you two to three hours worth of homework. And then I have two to three hours worth or an hour worth of tutoring or, an, or 30 minutes worth of counseling. And so that adds up pretty quickly and it can drain on an individual very, very fast. And so you wanna be mindful of all of this stuff as well as your teachers. Um, that's why we also put down the screen time for your staff and teachers as well, because they need to make sure that they're um, mindful of the screen time because we don't want to overwhelm them or fatigue them either. So again, we're recommending two to three hours of screen time per day for instruction and then maybe another hour or two of um, individual learning just to ensure you don't lose your students. And again, you're being ambitious yet attainable in relaying information to them. So we do offer services um, as Antonio was saying, to help you with your scheduling, um, we do want you to make sure you know that the digital divide is really widening and your students might not all have access to the information. And so scheduling is going to be very, very important. And it's inconsistent in many of the um, services, inconsistent in many of the communities that we serve. And so you want to make sure that you reach out to us if you have any needs, because we can help you ensure that your students are engaged and create a schedule that works for most groups. Um, and so um, let us know if you have anything that you might need. At the end of this, we'll have a survey for you to complete, um, outlining any services that you might be in need of. Thank you. So I'm going to make my screen a little bit bigger. Again, I'm Alicia Hill, and it is a pleasure to be here with you today. I'm so excited. We have about 22 people on the call. So I just want to see if you can put in the chat box, are you getting what you need? This how-to session we're about to dive into now, which platforms to use, how to organize your daily lessons. Um, so we've gone through scheduling, but so far, are you getting what you need? So we've learned about assessments, we've learned about scheduling, screen fatigue, et cetera. So thank you, Sheree Washington. Um, I'm glad that you're getting something out of this. So if you guys can, let us know in the chat box, how are we doing? Because we wanna make sure that we're giving you information and how to's that you actually can use. Great. So I'm gonna go ahead now and get started with just the curriculum piece. And um, each of us will probably be speaking a little bit from this, but as we talk about screen fatigue and attention span, we have to set up our curriculum to include live interaction, pre-recorded videos, virtual tours, so the kids still get that enrichment. They still know that there's a means to an end. And also our asynchronous meetings still have to be interactive um, and a self-paced environment. So that addresses the four core STEM curriculum, even soft skills. So what we're gonna do now is show you a little bit of information that we have in our repository for some of these instructional videos. So I'm gonna start with the pre-recorded videos. Any and everything that we do, whether it's live or it's something we're doing independently, we can record it ahead of time or we can record it after so that we can replay it. So that's the beauty of being in this online environment. So I am going to share my screen again, and I'm gonna start with my Learning Partners YouTube videos. So here is a list of instructional videos that I have created since maybe 2013. Some of these videos are very short in that they're only two minutes. So when Troy talked about attention span and TikTok videos, our students really want something that they can go ahead, learn from, and then back away from and try themselves. So the first video I'm gonna show you is, um, I think I'm gonna do the racist writing strategies. Are you guys able to see my screen? You see a lot of videos up here? I'm gonna make sure that I share it with sound. So let me do a new share. Oh, it is sharing with sound. So the first one, this is a racist writing strategy. Before I get started with it, are you able to see it? Can I get a thumbs up for those? Okay. So thumbs before up, I get, put it in the chat. Yes. So before I get started with it, notice this video is two minutes and eight seconds. We're not gonna watch the whole video. We're gonna only watch about maybe the first 30 seconds so that you get the gist. But notice it has 149,000 views. 
So students are using it, teachers are using it. five seconds, we learn how to write two sentences. That is how to write a topic sentence where you restate the question in a sentence form and then you answer the question when you start to give a little bit more details. So again, it's gotten quite a few views because students like to watch something short and sweet and it's still instructional. So that's one video and then just another video from the repository that's pretty recent it's during the COVID-19 when all of the schools shut down abruptly and then had to put their learning online. This video was created maybe eight weeks ago. And so far it has 1,850 views. But this is how to keep up with schoolwork during the coronavirus and just how to continue to enjoy your time and have a few teachers have used these types of videos. I'm going to stop sharing that as well because we do have another set of videos which is our STEM Wars channel and on this channel you'll get to see a lot of um, STEM Wars activities that took place during the face-to-face -face traditional setting but anything that's done there can be replicated even online. Troy do you want to speak to this a little bit? Yes, yes, yes. So we've taken the, um, the time during this pandemic to actually convert all of our curriculum, as Dr. Hill has stated, to an online platform. So again, the same, and we were very strategic in doing it um, because we didn't want, we wanted to make sure it wasn't just talking heads, but it was just as engaging. The hardest part of it was ensuring that our virtual content was as engaging as our live performances. And so we've painstakingly gone through the process of making sure that we get the lighting right, the sound right, the camera angles and things of that nature. So again, it's really, really interactive and engaging for our students. Um, as Dr. Hill was saying, the beauty of our pre-recorded videos, so you would still get live instruction, very similar to this um, experience right here, where we're actually um, speaking to you, but you have a video playing in the background through our live instruction courses. We're able to come out to better people and talk with prospective students. The beauty, yeah, the, the, the beauty of our pre-recorded videos, the, Go ahead. the beauty of our pre-recorded videos is that you get to actually serve as your own assistant. And so we'd have an instructor um, who video record the lesson and they'd be playing it, but then they'd be able to stop and answer any questions they might have or enter into the chat room and answer any questions they might have and not necessarily have to lose their place in the middle of their instruction. So it gives you the presentation and the production value of an insert or in-person performance but it gives you the resources of allowing it to be pre-recorded and you have the features to be able to still be interactive. So again, our virtual classroom and our virtual um, STEM curriculum is very, very engaging um, and that was the goal of it. So I'm showing a video now of um, STEM Wars and this and they're all setting. So it's a really great opportunity for the students to get to know about a variety of schools as well, not just like the one school that they may be able to go visit. So in terms of enrichment, and you think about how can you expand your curriculum beyond the four core, STEM, STEAM as we know it, will help to address some of those real life um, opportunities that kids can engage in. And I'm going to go, go ahead, Troy. I'm going to turn it back over to Troy because he's now going to talk to us about virtual tours. 
Yep. And so I, I was going to end there and just say that with the implementation of the curriculum, you want to make sure that you engage them as often as possible and have as many interesting pieces as possible. And so that's why with the sample schedule we provided, it shows that on Fridays, you reserve those for virtual tours and guest speakers, but you can actually include that into any day of your week and any time frame because the goal is to keep your students as engaged as possible. There are numerous free resources um, like uvisit.com, which actually has a plethora of virtual college tours for you to access and just give your students the videos. We encourage you when you do your virtual tours and when you invite your guest speakers that your evaluations are a little more engaging than traditional. So traditionally we'd ask, is this a school you might want to attend? Do they offer the majors you might want to um, engage in? What was the food in the cafeteria? Did you like the demographics? What is the price of tuition? Just those several le surface level questions. But with the virtual tour, you want to be a lot more engaging and in descriptive. And so maybe even asking in the virtual tour, which building um, or what color was the shirt of the tour guide when they were standing in front of the library? Or questions of that nature? Or what sandwich did the guy or what restaurant did they visit during the virtual tour? So again, ensuring that the students are actually paying attention and looking for those details because it's not the same as a traditional tour, even though it's very, very engaging and the photography and cinematography is um, movie quality, it's still not the same as being on a campus. And so you wanna make sure your students are as engaged as possible. And so asking them those kind of descriptive questions will ensure that they're actually paying attention um, and receiving the information. Awesome. So when we talk about self-paced lessons and making them interactive, we're also able to give you a curriculum with the four core. So we have a repository of resources for each subject area that we'll be able to provide to you as well. In addition to that STEM curriculum, and then there's also curriculum about soft skills as we try to reach our students and help them grow emotionally and mature but also to communicate with each other. Now more than ever, we know that communication is what we have to lean on. So being able to express feelings, express themselves, have conversations, um, written and verbal conversations is super important at this time. So we're gonna move forward now to some more good stuff. And that is, which online platform are you using or considering? So in the chat box, Think about your school. So most of you are housed on college campuses, so you may have access to Blackboard, or you might be using Canvas, or you might even be using Teams, Google Meet, and Zoom. In the chat box, what platform are you using? I will tell you, most school districts are using Zoom and Google Meet. So the kids are already familiar with those two platforms more than likely the most, especially if they're in the high school. So I see Zoom, WebEx, Zoom, yes. Looks like we might have some Zoom experts on the call. So if you were to take a look at this chart, Zoom does offer a free basic plan. And during this pandemic, if you are using your college institution or your public school's email account, then you get some extra features with Zoom for free. So notice it says length 40 minutes, no limit with education account because that means that you have an extension that might be um, k12.edu or k12.org. Your organization is already recognized as a nonprofit or a public institution. And so therefore you can create your Zoom account with that, but um, you have more than 40 minutes, 100 participants, where it says live stream, you still don't have access to that. However, um we're doing something that's live right now it's just you wouldn't be able to stream it as far as with youtube but i am seeing a lot of integrations between zoom and other platforms also you can record to your computer like this particular session we're doing right now we're going to record it take a look at it and we may give it back to participants so that you guys can rewatch. so again that beauty of having something online and also it allows us to do breakout rooms. So if you were to look at Teams, pretty much the same thing. Um, Google Meet, the only difference between Google Meet and Zoom is Google Meet, you can't give people a link ahead of time. You have to create the link 
on the day of and invite people the day of the hour of right when the meeting is getting ready to start. But with Zoom, you all got a link a week ago and I can make it reoccurring. So just take a look at that. I see Teams. Teams is also awesome. Not a lot of people have Teams. Um, it is with the Microsoft Outlook um, email service, but it is great if you do have it. Some of the same features of Zoom. So right now, as you can see, we're on a Zoom. So we're going to show you how to use Zoom in order to take your program online. So there are about five features that are like top tips and tricks that we're going to talk to you about. So in order to set up a Zoom meeting in settings, and I'm going to start sharing my screen right now since most of you have Zoom accounts. In settings, let's go here. I'm sorry, give me a second. You can't see that one. You just see Zoom, right? I believe it is here. Okay. So now I'm sharing with you. Do you see where it says schedule meeting? Thumbs up? Yes. All right. So on schedule meeting, since we're looking at some of the features right now, if you go over to settings, this is how you can set up your meetings in order to have breakout rooms, in order to create polls, um, in order to mute participants as they're coming in, in order to give have a password so that your meetings aren't hijacked. In this settings box over here in meetings is where you get to do all of that um, setting your meeting up. If you have a paid Zoom account, you can also do telephone and you can also give them a link. So if people are driving and they wanna call in, they're able to do that. Features that I'm gonna show you are like the require the password for an instant meeting or require passwords. Also muting participants upon entry. You want to still recognize and appreciate and respect people's privacy. The chat box feature is on, which is why you guys are able to use it, as well as the private chat. So if you were to click on someone's name, you can send them a private message and everyone in the group doesn't see that chat box. In addition, as you see where it says co-host, you can allow co-hosts to share their screen, start meetings on time. So if you have a team of people that you want to invite in on the meetings, you can do that. And then polling. I love the polling feature. The polling feature, and you see that down there, allows you to get real-time feedback. If teachers are using this with their students as well, if they are trying to assess their students in the moment, they can create a poll where the students get to respond either anonymously or the teacher can see them respond by name. And then the teacher can share those results as well. So initially we ask you, where are you from? Had we created a poll, we would have got to see your name, where you're from, kind of like poll everywhere. I'm pretty sure some of you are familiar with that. And then you would be able to see that on the screen. So again, just quick tips around Zoom and what all it can do. Down here where we see annotation, participants can use an annotation tool if you turn that on in order to add information. So if I have something on the screen that I'm drawing or I want them to respond to, they can do that as well. And then, breakout rooms. You can go ahead and set up your breakout rooms so that students can have small group sessions. If you're running a training yourself, then you can put people in small groups. And I'm going to show you quickly how to do a breakout. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen and I'm going to start sharing my screen. I don't know if you can see it, but you might be able to see everybody's picture. So do you see my screen at all? Right now, I'm going to create breakout rooms. So we're only gonna be there for about 30 seconds. Just say hi to everybody, use your chat box, just play around in there. But I'm gonna randomly assign us where it says we have 26 participants and I get to assign all 26 of us. I'm gonna to try to do that evenly. Actually, you know what? I'm going to do two rooms. So I'm going to do 13 people per room. So you're, when you get there, all I want you to do is say hi to each other 
and then I want you to leave the room. You'll see where you can leave that room. So I'm creating the room now. And I'm going to open all rooms. And so go ahead and join. You should get something that says join room. Hi, Brittany and Sylvia. Are you guys able to join the breakout room? Hi, Troy and Antonio. Are you back on my screen where it shows the Zoom? Yeah, I'm back. Gotcha. We're back. So all the rooms are closing in about 23 seconds. So everybody, if they're not hitting return, they'll be brought back. To okay. the so we only have about 14 seconds before they come back. And now- I actually went in the room with them. I was in room two, hanging out. Hey. Hi, Miss Brownlee. Is that grand? Is that daughter or granddaughter? Granddaughter. Oh, she loves grandma. All right. Looks like everybody is back. Yeah. All right. So, just in the chat box, how was that experience with going into your breakout rooms? Notice you left 26 people and you came back. So if it was a cool experience, please just give us a thumbs up or throw it in the chat box down there. So if you have students where you need to do counseling sessions with them, if you have students where they need more one-on-ones, if you have students where you're allowing them to work on a project together, here's an atmosphere. And what I really like about breakout rooms too is I can give everybody access to share their screen. So if I was going to have some type of celebration and it's for of the entire program, but I have it by grade level, we can still all come to this one big session. I can create breakout rooms based on grade level, assign instructors to it, and then the students can go to their celebrations. Some people can have music if they want, some people can have awards if they want, but what we really like about Zoom is it's a really, really cool feature. We'll be able to help you with that as well if you were to um, request for further services. Hey, Doc, oh. it's also good for orientations. If, if they are having their orientations and they want to break out by grade, if they want to break out by, uh, uh, by subject matter, you can do that on your orientation day as well. So it's very functional for these programs. Yes. Yes. So what I want to show you now is our virtual backgrounds. So in the chat box, I just gave you an image. What we love about virtual backgrounds is our kids come from everywhere. I am one of those students who I, I grew up with very humble means. And so if I were going through this pandemic right now, I would not want people to see what's happening in my household. I wouldn't want them to see the handprints on the wall. I wouldn't want them to see the sofa. I just probably wouldn't want them to even be in my private life. So notice that each of us have a background. What I love about virtual backgrounds is one, it promotes community, unity, school spirit. In addition, if I have a messy room, I don't have to clean it up. I don't. So
So um, these virtual backgrounds will help put students and staff at ease as well because it protects their privacy. It also gives them a sense of pride that I belong to an organization, I belong to something. So in the chat box, download the image that I just gave you. And when you download it, it's probably going to go to downloads. But you're just going to type in the number two and you can easily find it. So what I'm going to do is walk you through, once it's downloaded, how to upload your virtual background. We have 26 people on the call and only the three of us are showing our faces and our backgrounds. And during this time, we ask people to lean into the discomfort so that we can still make it an environment that feels real and feels like we're connected. So it's really important that we do show our faces during this time. But for whatever reason, some of us feel uncomfortable with that. So this, I'm gonna ask you, can we just lean into that discomfort, download this virtual background, and I'm gonna walk you through how to upload it. So I'm going to stop sharing this screen, but again, everybody should have in the chat box an image. Download that image. And I'll walk you through. All right, so here we go. Once you download the image, you are going to right beside your camera is where it says stop video. You're gonna select that down arrow and you're gonna see choose virtual background. When you click on choose virtual background, you should be able to see my screen now. You're going to get to click add image. When you hit add image, your folders are going to appear. Click on downloads and you're looking for your picture that says two. So you add the picture and then at the bottom, you're gonna see where there are two clicks where it says, I have a green screen or mirror my video. Unclick those if they are clicked already. If you try to click, unclick, I have a green screen, it might give you an error message that says, doesn't meet minimum, computer doesn't meet minimum requirements. So just leave it alone, don't worry about it. You'll still be able to upload your background. So this is what each of our backgrounds should look like now. So let's see who all was able to do that. We still have quite a few people who aren't trying it. Let's lean into the discomfort. Yay. I see you, Cherie. Let me tell you something too. So if you were to scroll through and look like look at Cherie, if you'll say something so that your name populates in the beginning. Hi everyone. Yay. So notice Cherie's background, you can see half of it, but you see pictures on the wall. So when you're using a green screen, if your computer doesn't meet minimum requirements, make sure you're on a background with a flat surface. Usually backgrounds like white or green, or if you have butcher paper, create your own green screen. If you have a white sheet, hang it up on your back wall, but then your background will work better. Thank you. Someone said I didn't get the download. I'm gonna put it in the chat box again. There you go. So thank you for trying that, Cherie. And I did see other people trying it. And again, we will be able to walk you through that as well. Um, and now the time is 9.50. So I wanna make sure that we are respecting your time and we have other things to show you. So if you need more assistance, tools, resources that are ready to use, if you need a turnkey program, we're here to assist you with that. We walk through assessments, we walk through scheduling, we walk through curriculum, and now we're finishing up on just the different types of instructional training that we'll be able to provide around Zoom, any technical assistance, and also branding. 
What we like about these virtual backgrounds, again, it creates that school pride, that program pride, that sense of privacy. So we're also um, able to give branding packages to each of you. So at the end, we will put out a link that has our service package request form. If you need any more assistance, please complete that link. So our last tip, and this is a bonus for you, is Google Classrooms. Everybody heard of Google Classrooms? So we spoke earlier about um, Blackboard. Um, Google Classroom is similar, but most school districts are using it. Where students might not be familiar with Blackboard, they will be familiar and teachers with Google Classroom. So we're gonna show you these top tips and tricks. So Google Classroom is really easy. If you have a Gmail account, you have access to Classrooms. Most students nowadays have Gmail accounts. Most adults have Gmail accounts. And if you have an access to a Gmail account, your Google Classroom feature is already active. Only thing you would do is click on Drive, and then you have a Google Classroom. So we're gonna walk you through that briefly on how you create it. So I'm going to share another screen. And actually, I'm gonna share this one. This is my son's Google Classroom. And as you can see, he has all seven periods here. See that? Now, he and his friends can create a classroom if he wanted to, but right here on Google, you know, you have the waffle there. You just click classroom. We will be able to show your instructors how to do that, and we can actually set that up for your instructors. I want you to see what it looks like on the student end. So again, this is my son's seven periods. This is his counselor, Coach Car Carter, who is able to provide class announcements in the stream. So starting with May 18th, here's the application he gave them for summer. Students are able to click on it, download it, complete it. So this is for Atlanta Virtual. We actually have to complete this application by tomorrow. He will be taking algebra. So <laughs> um, going back to classwork, so no place for hate activity. My son will click on classwork. It was due April 29th, I have to get with him. This is what my son does. He'll do the assignment, submit it, and then not hit mark as done. But the beauty is, and I chose this, you can see, students can see which assignments are missing. And I love it again, because when I go back to classwork, I get to filter which assignments he hasn't completed. Right here, view your work. I can view what's been assigned. I can review what's been returned with a grade. Remember, this is a counselor, so he's not grading anything. And then I can review everything that's missing. So he has one assignment missing there. Over here, where you have the three lines, if I click there, I get to see all classes. And I'm going to choose, I'm gonna choose his fourth period teacher just because she's right there. Fourth period. These are her announcements on the stream. Here's her classwork. I get to view his work. And teachers are also able to, as you see, attach things. I'm gonna click missing, just so I can see what he has missing. He has something from January and September that's missing. Gonna go back to assigned. I get to view details. I also get to see what he submitted right here. So they can give tests, quizzes, kids get to take everything right there online. Teachers are able to enroll students. 
or students are able to enroll themselves if they were given the code, code. But right here where it says people, you see the teachers that are listed. Ms. Shea is their assistant principal. So in this case, you might have a director in your program. And then all of their classmates are here. If he wanted to email a classmate or a teacher, he would just click on the envelope right there. So that is Google Classrooms, very user-friendly. Um, again, most students are familiar with it. The time now is 9.56. We wanted to make sure that this session was an hour long for you, but you got, it was impactful and you got valuable information. So we're getting ready to close out. So I'm gonna turn this again over to Troy and Antonio. All right, folks. Troy, unmute yourself. Yep, yep. All right. Well, folks, as you can see, there is a lot. We did pack a lot into this hour long collaborative opportunity, learning opportunity for you guys. The goal was to expose you to some, some things that you already knew, but to, to try and uncover at what level of depth you knew it. Like one thing I just learned who knew that little circle with the pick with the dots in the middle was called a waffle. Now you can be honest with me now. Did you know that was called a waffle? It looks like a waffle. Makes sense that they call it a waffle. I didn't know that thing was called a waffle. I, I thought it was the circle with the squares in the middle. <laughs> Look more like a, a, a road, uh, you know, one of those, those manhole covers to me. But waffle, come on now. I didn't know. But anyway, you, it's, these little things right here is what you learn and you begin to, just think about it. If a student simply walked away with knowing that that little thing circle in the, in the corner was a waffle, they would take that with them for the rest of their life. And you can you imagine how many people they would tell about that particular thing that they learned today? Hey, bro, did you know that was a waffle? I know I'm about to tell a few people in a minute, and I can't wait to show it off when I get an opportunity. But anyway, the bottom line is, guys, that transitioning your program to online is not as simple as, as, as taking what you've already done and putting it online. You need to, you have to assess the capabilities of everybody in, involved. You have to assess the ability of everyone involved. And you also have to make sure that you as a program, you assess you as a program and your ability to provide this. One of the things that I had to do, and I'll use my program as an example, we're going to, I've, I've already purchased training to teach my folks how to teach on online because K-12 teachers aren't used to it. And so not just how to use the learning uh, management system, but how to use video conferencing the way um, um, Dr. Hill was just fluent in showing us how to move in and out of sessions and how to how to click on this because they're gonna have to teach our students because remember our students are social media savvy. Not many of them are as tech savvy as we may need them to move in and out. And if you are providing them a computer that they're not used to using, that's also another learning curve. They've got to learn how to how to use the, the, the electronic devices. And so all of this may factor in to the, the, the quality of the learning experience uh, that they have this summer. So you really do need to be assessing these things uh, with respect to how your program will be transitioned to online and how your students will transition to learning online. I caution, I caution all of you to be very careful with your uh, with what you request out of your students instead of using the traditional grading scale this summer I'd pay more attention to and also uh, really reward participation because many of them are dealing with things that they can't quite express yet how it has impacted them uh, I have several students in my program who've lost family members to COVID whose parents have lost jobs to COVID and what was a low income student now is even lower income. And so taking those things into consideration, students have had to take on jobs and different things of that nature. And, and um, I pride myself in having high performing students, but the thing about it is I am recognizing what they are going through. And so their mental health is very important to me. And so as you look to transition online, if you really don't understand how to do this, we provide these services. The branding that Dr. Uh, Hill talked about as well. If you look at her backdrop, look at my backdrop. You saw me switch several backdrops during the time we were talking. Not just branding your program, but actually protecting the integrity of the student, that layered experience. The reason schools use uniforms sometimes is to, 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 uh, to limit bullying. 
you can't pick at a kid who has on a white and blue shirt if you've got on the same white and blue shirt. So if kids have the same background, the likelihood that they'll get picked on or they have to worry about what's going on in the background at their home, whether the wall has fingerprints on it or whatever have you, that particular uh, threat goes down. And then creating content, the availability of content and content creation. You guys are dealing with enough having to deal with some of the administrative f fights that you're having at your college, dealing with uh, trying to figure out how you're going to pay for this and transitioning to the systems that they're requiring you to shift to and the fact that it takes a little bit longer to work things up the ladder, even though we are working from home and people should be answering their emails and stuff all the time. You're dealing with all of those things. And so the la sometimes the last thing that you can afford to do is, is create from scratch in a short period of time because June is right around the corner the content necessary to create a very successful program. So we have the content creation as well. We also offer <clears throat> more services uh, as needed that we can either create or that we have that we just haven't listed online. So just know um, that um, <clears throat> a in, the survey has been dropped into the chat box um, and you could use that survey to not only critique what it is that we did today, but to also express to us what your needs might be. Mr. Curry? As we close, I just want to say the same thing. Um, thank you for your time. But just again, please be mindful that while we um, look to transition to a virtual platform, we are currently experiencing a pandemic and all of our communities and students have been personally affected by the COVID-19 virus. Um, so you want to remain mindful of the expectations that you're putting on both your staff and your students this summer. You want to ensure that whether your expectation, whatever your expectations are though, that you adequately share them um, with everybody involved and that normalcy and reliability are gonna be some of the greatest comforts during these uncertain times. So remain consistent with your communication methods. If you're using Google Classrooms, make sure that you use that and you post your methods there or your messages there and students know how to access them. If you're using group text messages like a group me service or something of that nature, be consistent with when you send your messages out so they know what to look for and can kind of plan their days around that. And then finally, as Antonio and Dr. Hill both relayed throughout this presentation, if you don't have the time or resources, to um, create these engaging videos and curriculum on your own. There are numerous online resources to include our virtual ed collaborative. And um, we have over 100 partners that we're working with to ensure we have the most engaging and up-to-date curriculum possible. Um, so again, we know that TRIO is a family and that you guys will rise to the occasion um, to ensure that the students are served as they've been in the past. And while I have a moment, since Troy and I probably have the most familiar face, faces on here, I do want us to, uh, to I, I do just want to thank the innovation and the creativity and just the knowledge base uh, of one Dr. Alicia Hill. I want to give her a round of applause. Thank Honestly, you. guys, uh, we could not bring this to you without her assistance, without her innovative thought process, and without her guiding us through the process, because Troy and I are naturally creators. Uh, we, we've created a lot and we talk well and things of that nature, but um, Dr. Hill, on top of those skill sets, she brings about a sense of organization, uh, the beautiful display that you see operating Zoom, all of those things. She is the one who, is, uh, who, who coordinated a lot of these efforts that you are seeing in front of you. And we just want to thank her for entrusting us in our, in, in our vision and the desire to collaborate. And this is what uh, you have, this is what is before you, something she did. Um, so we, we want to thank her. Um, guys, also, as you go into the fall, you have to realize you're using this as your dress rehearsal for your trio program in the fall as well. The likelihood that we will return to business as usual is not that high. Uh, I saw that the University of South Carolina on oh, yesterday is flirting with going back in early August, but ending in October. So basically the students will not go back after Thanksgiving. I've seen other institutions not starting to October until they see what's going on. Think about how your program is going to be adjusting and what the colleges or high schools are gonna allow you to do in terms of access to your students. Get ready now. Uh, Dr. Hill? Yes, thank you so much for those kind words, Antonio and Troy. I mean, guys, this really is a collaborative effort. We all bring such talents and gifts um, and connections to this work. And we want to make sure that because it's each of our passions and we know that it's our purpose, we want to live that out. So that's why we did provide this training to you for free. Um, 
if you know that, hey, I think I got it, but I need somebody to help me think through the program, we also offer that innovative design thinking where we take you and your team through the process, even though that wasn't up there. But if you feel like, hey, I think we have the tools and resources, we just want some more help with getting it up off the ground. We can work with your team and facilitate design thinking where we can help you design your program through that process. Um, so thank you all for showing up and participating with us and trusting us to provide you with these tips and strategies. Again, we come from different backgrounds, but we're all part of this education arena. And we wanna make sure that our students, I was a first generation college student. I have roots in TRIO and um, educational talent search from Macon, Georgia in 2001 when I was a teacher. So I'm really, really happy to be a part of this collaborative. And we're gonna go ahead and close out now with any questions and answers. If any of you guys wanna stay back, we have about 10 minutes that we can stay back. But thank you for the comments in the chat box and letting us know that it was valuable and, and informative for you. And now we're just gonna open it up um, for about five minutes or so for any questions that you may have. And we understand that people need to leave, but please complete that link that's in the chat box. So if you want to unmute your mic, do you have any questions? Hey, I just uh, I just went to the link in the chat box, Ms. Hill, uh, yes. and I was completing it, but they won't let me submit because they're telling me that my email needs to have a number in it. So um, huh. I don't know exactly what's going on there. Okay. It might it might be one of those uh, features, Dr. Hill, that we might have on that is required by accident or something that we didn't turn out like a required one of the requirements. We'll check that. We'll do that, uh, now. and we'll make that adjustment right now. Are you are you on that, Antonio? Or you want me to do that? It's probably best that you do it because you can do multiple things at one time. <laughs> okay. Troy's in it too. Any other questions that you guys might have? Well, before other people start to leave, if you don't have any questions, again, if you want to ask us in the chat box as well, we'll answer. Unmute yourself if you have a question. And Troy and I specifically want to thank all of the TRIO folks who have supported us since we were vice presidents and presidents. We see a lot of family uh, on here, people that we consider family. We thank you for your genuine love. We really do appreciate that. And we know why you're here. And we really, really thank you. But please, please unmute yourselves. You can comment. You can ask us any questions. We're going to hang around for about 10 more minutes. Other than that, have an amazing, amazing day. Uh, and we look forward to hearing from you once we get this uh, this technicality on the survey worked out. Um, I think we've got it. We've got it figured out. I, I wouldn't have changed it. Okay. Thank you, Dre. Got figured out. Is as you stated, it asked for a number. It was a short answer, but it asked, they said it should be a number included. Right. All right. We're just gonna hang around, guys. You guys can, you know, you guys can uh, depart at, at your leisure, but we will be here to answer questions. Um, but again, we know that we did breeze through this kind of quickly because we did want to cover a lot of information. And so if there are any questions you might have, please don't hesitate to ask them. I'm still having a problem trying to get to the link as far as the chat box was concerned. Are you able to oh, find it? I'm going to put the link in the chat box again. That's D Jones out there. I see Derek Jones out there. I see you, Derek Jones, all the way from Mississippi. Who was that that just spoke? I'll send you the Mary Griffin. That's Miss Mary Griffin. Yes. Hey, Miss Mary, send you how you doing? Private chat. So, Miss Mary, I'm sending you the link now in the chat box. Okay. What's up, Antonio Robinson? Ah, Derrick Jones, all the, <laughs> up, er, up, all the way from the middle Mississippi. Y'all doing all right this morning? Doing yeah. well, man. Good to see your face, brother. Good to see you. Early, me. too. You an hour behind, correct? Yeah, I'm telling you, the man up early. Man. Yeah, I'm an hour behind. Yeah, man. So you're an hour ahead day. today, so we appreciate you. I'm not sure what my problem is. Yes, ma'am. Miss Sylvia, I just sent you the link. So Ms. Montgomery, you good to go over there? Ms. Harriet, you good? Unmute yourself, Ms. Harriet. I got it. You're unmuted, Ms. Harriet. I got you. She she just she tried to unmute when you unmuted and she went back mute. Yeah. 
They're still asking for a number on their email. Troy, they still ask for a number. All right, Miss Harriet, now I can hear you. Okay, I apologize. I did not realize that the mm -hmm. webinar started at 8 o'clock instead of 9. I'm just logging on. Is there any way I can participate at the 1 o'clock hour, which would probably be 12 o'clock my time? Yes, ma'am. Okay.